stretches round the world, walks through every wall. Your love searches for the lost, makes the foulest clean, reaches even me. You love, you love, you love, you love us all the same. Your love sees the broken heart, binds up every wound, steps into the dark. Hey, good morning, friends. Welcome to River Heights Vineyard, and welcome if you're joining us at home. I'm Justin. I'm one of the pastors here. I'm really glad that you are here. Now we get to be in the Lord's presence together. I'm going to invite you to stand if you're able as we begin. Um, we leaders are going to be singing this morning, and you will not. It gives us plenty of opportunity as well, though, to think about uh, the Lord's presence here among us. So let's just invite the Lord. Uh, thank you, God, that it's your invitation that draws us here. And though we've come, God, it's your heart that reached out to us first. So we invite you, Holy Spirit. We say, come, Holy Spirit. We ask for the, the grace to give ourselves to you, to offer our hearts to you this morning. Also, uh, the grace to receive every good thing that you have for us. Yeah, the Lord loves you. The Lord is with you today, friends. He's here. Justice flowing down. There's a sorrow in this hour. We are watching, watching for the Lord. Watching for the Lord. Faithful hearts make way for Him. He's coming like He said.
let's make way for him. You're coming like you said. Son of God, draw near to us. You're coming like you said. Faithful hearts, faithful hearts, make way for him. You're coming like you said. Son of God, draw near to us. You're coming like you said. Yeah, Lord, thank you for coming to us. This is the uh, third week of Advent, the uh, weeks leading up to Christmas. And in church history, Advent is a season of waiting, expectation, and hope. You notice we're singing songs of those same themes. In Advent, we remember how God's people longed for deliverance from evil and oppression. They waited expectantly, looking for the Savior that God had promised to send. They anticipated the day a Savior would come when God would break through the darkness and save them and make them free. And so we're going to invite you to have a seat here in the room. We've got uh, friends from home that are going to lead us in our lighting of the, the third Advent candle, the, the joy candle. That's the Masins. So it's a great it's a treat. Good morning, Weaver Heights, and happy Sunday. We are the Masin. My name is Teddy. And I'm Layla. I'm Jemina. I'm Johanna. Today we light up the candle of joy. Isaiah 9 2 says, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Let us pray. Jesus, you are joy even in the saddest times. Help us to praise you when we are upset or grieving. Shine joy into our hearts, we pray. Amen. In Luke chapter 1, verse 46 to 55, Mary says this, My soul proclaims in the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has looked with favor on his lowly servant. From this day, all generations will call me blessed. The Almighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. He has mercy for those who fear him in every generation. He has shown the strength of his arm. He has scattered the proud of their conceit. He has cast down the mighty of their thrones. And he has lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things. And, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has come to help of his servant Israel. For he has remembered his promise of mercy. The promise he made to our fathers, to Abraham and his children forever. Let us pray. Lord, our joy is knowing that you love us, are with us, and are guiding with our lives. We choose to learn into your presence so that we can begin our experience, the real timeless joy of being your children. Amen. 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 It's wonderful. Oh, what a great Christmas set up at their place, right? It's awesome. Uh, let's stand together if you're able, and we're going to do one more song together. Savior reigns. Let all the 
Sounding joy, repeat, repeat the sounding joy. Sing joy, joy, unspeakable joy, and overflowing well, no tongue can tell. Joy, unspeakable. as you came in that you probably have. It's a little cup. There's a film on the top, the wafer, and then another film, and then the uh, juice is under that. Those elements signify Jesus' sacrifice on the cross for you and for me. Every uh, And every week I get to lead us in this prayer. On the night he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread and he gave thanks. He broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, take this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine and he gave thanks. He gave it to them. And he said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Lord Jesus, come in glory. And it's through Christ and with Christ and in Christ and in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory are yours, Almighty Father, forever and ever. Amen. And we're going to invite Pete up to do announcements. And if you haven't taken those elements yet, you should do that right now. Bless you, friends. Good morning, everybody. Happy Sunday. My name is Pete. I'm one of the pastors here. Really glad that you're able to be with us today. And I like to start our services with a prayer for those who can't be with us right now. So God, we're so grateful that you have given us Christ 
and that you have given us the gift of each other uh, gathered together today here, and that you've given us our brothers and sisters who can't be with us yet. We ask that you would send your Holy Spirit, God, here today and in every room uh, for every person who is a part of our family. We ask, would you come, God? And uh, we know that we're united in you, and still we pray. Would you bring us back together, Lord, safely and soon? Amen. 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 Uh, I want to thank you for wearing your mask during our services. Uh, we want to remind you that we ask you to wear those uh, during all our services right now. We're not wearing them to protect ourselves. We're wearing them to protect the people around us. And so thank you for having your mask on today. Our purpose at River Heights Vineyard, the reason God has us existing in the first place, is to help a growing number of people love God, love people, and change the world. That is what we're about in every season. And so uh, we have an opportunity to give each Sunday. Instructions for doing so electronically are on the screen behind me. There's boxes that you can put uh, gifts in uh, near the door on your way out. And we always invite people to consider special year-end giving, some people for tax advantages, some people just because it's a season of generosity. And uh, we've had a generous community this year. We have uh, been really blessed by how generous people have been through a really difficult season for so many of us. Uh, at the same time, we've had some weird expenses this year. We had a furnace go out. We had to replace that thing, just as surprising to us as it is when it happens at home. Uh, <laughs> you, you never plan for the furnace to die. Uh, I mean, you kind of do, right? Like, we, we made it. But uh, there have been some real uh, challenges as well as blessings. And so if you want to make a gift uh, toward the year end, you can just put year end giving in your check or year end giving in the memo if you're giving through push pay. And thank you for your generosity. God bless you. Uh, could you take the connection card out of your program, please? I ask, we all ask, would you fill one of these out every week that you come? If you're with us regularly, you can just put your name on there. And if you're visiting with us, give us as much information as you're comfortable. And there's stuff going on that you can uh, interact with. The important thing to us is the prayer request section. We want you to know that people in your church are praying for you. And so let us know how to pray for you. Each week, those of us on staff pray for every request. And so uh, fill that out. I'll have four things on here by the end of the service. At the end of the service, they go in the connection card boxes. Thank you. Uh, we have an event coming up. It's the Intertwined Women's Virtual Event. The heart of Intertwined is cultivating relationships and lives that are intertwined by living life together side by side and prayer by prayer. And so you're invited to join on December 18th at 7.30 via Zoom. That's online, and it is super easy. And if you need help with that, you can just let us know on your connection card. There will be community, conversation, and prayer. All women are welcome. And you can get more details for that on riverheightsvineyard.org. We have our Christmas Eve drive-in service coming up on Christmas Eve at 4 o'clock. Throw on your Christmas PJs or dress up in a tux and a prom dress, whatever seems appropriate. Bring some hot cocoa and park your car here. You'll turn, tune your radio in to the FM station, which we will be locally broadcasting from, and you'll have Christmas Eve with your River Heights family. You can stay in your cars, we'll sing Christmas carols, listen to scripture, and enjoy the light of Christ in a unique way. We have limited parking spaces, and so register so that you can be sure to get a parking spot. You can register on your connection card or online. And the church is looking to borrow three more portable fire pits, and we're looking for eight to ten people who would be willing to serve as a parking lot crew. And so we need help. If you would be willing to help in either of those ways, let us know on your connection card and thank you. Due to COVID, we're going to be unable to have our Christmas Day dinner, which is crushing. COVID is stupid. It makes me, it makes me unhappy. We advertise all over the community for anyone who doesn't have someone to spend Christmas with to spend it here. And last year we had 280 people come. And we just cannot picture how to do 280 people with food uh, in this season. And so um, I just want to encourage you to enjoy God's presence in your Christmas with your family and loved ones. And God willing, we'll be back at it again next year. All right. God bless you, friends. I'm going to invite Courtney up to preach. She's a member of our volunteer preaching team. Let's welcome her. Thank you for that. Makes it fun to come up here. Good morning. 
Uh, as Pete said, my name is Courtney Herewald, and I am a part of the volunteer preaching team at here at River Heights. And I'm really grateful for the opportunity to be here with you today, not only because I enjoy doing this, but because as a stay-at-home mom during a pandemic, this actually gets me out of the house. <laughs> and so I'm happy about that as well, um, even if it's just for a brief period of time. Um, I don't know about you, but I, it almost has become difficult for me to remember what normal life was like. I know we talk about the new normal, but I don't know what that means either. And somehow these months have felt like years uh, with the amount of challenges, uncertainty, and loss that we have, many of us have faced. Um, so I just want to um, begin today by saying a prayer that God would just meet us wherever you might be at right now, whether you're here in this building or whether you're watching. Um, we just want to invite God's presence here. God, we thank you that you are with us. We thank you that you care for us, that you see us, that you know us, that no matter what we might be going through right now, God, that we are your children and we are loved by you. And so I pray that you would speak to our hearts today, uh, that we would be able to hear your voice and that you would strengthen and encourage us. Amen. So today, I'm going to continue with our sermon series based out of the book, The Good and Beautiful Community by James Bryant Smith. We've been going through each chapter focusing on what the community of God is called to be. And this week's focus is on the encouraging community. How many of you could use some encouragement? <laughs> I know I can. And I'll be the first to admit, though, that trying to speak about um, community at all right now is challenging. When we're living in the midst of a time that prevents many of us from experiencing community in many of the ways that we have been used to. Or when we're living in, a, we've lived through a contentious election year and one of racial unrest, and it's often made it easier for us to engage in divisive rhetoric with one another when we don't have to actually see each other face to face. You know, we might begin asking ourselves in the midst of all of this, where is God in all of this? Especially, I think, if we feel disconnected from those who might remind us, uh, from those who could be the ones to remind us that it's in our times of greatest struggle often that the community of Christ is the one that has been there for us and helps us to see God in the midst of our circumstances. We may say some prayers and we may wish we could be in church together again, but maybe we start to forget what it feels like to be in a place where we feel loved and cared for and strengthened in our faith. And with our inability to meet together in person in many cases, we might convince ourselves that we'll be fine on our own, or at least that we'll make it through, right? We might tell ourselves that there's really not much we can do for anyone right now anyways. And plus, we might just feel too exhausted from Zoom meetings, from distant teaching kids, or trying to figure out how we're going to get another job or worrying about our health. We may feel like we don't really have anything left to give to anyone else. So the temptation for many of us, myself included, is to find ways to help cope with this to help us maybe forget if even just for a little while that all the about all the pain and the struggles that we face we think that if we can just escape a little while watch some netflix withdraw into ourselves numb ourselves by overindulging in food drink you name it we can somehow get through this or survive this how many of you have used that term when someone's asked you how you are doing i'm surviving right we are trying to survive until all, everything can get back to normal again. And somehow it seems easier to withdraw or numb ourselves than to reach out and engage. You know, I've certainly felt this way on and off over this past crazy year, and yet there's this constant nudging in my soul that this time is not something that we're meant to just get through or survive. And that longing that I feel in that absence of meaningful connection, it's actually been placed in me for a reason. This desire to do more than simply survive the challenges we're facing is telling of a bigger picture that can too easily be forgotten in the midst of turmoil and suffering and challenges, especially when we feel disconnected from community, from an encouraging community. And I've been thinking a lot about what causes us to forget. 
And as a result, I'm even more convinced that we're not meant to live this life of faith alone. That the church, even with all of its flaws from human frailty, is actually God's gift to us. On our own, it becomes much more difficult to stay connected to God and to have a clear picture of who God is. In a way, I think the church community is meant to be a living reminder, a memorial even, of who God is. And when we're reminded of who God is, we're also reminded of who we are, who we were created to be. You know, there are reasons why we memorialize things. It's that we, so that we honor the memory of a person or event by having a constant reminder not to forget because it's much easier than we might think. A recent example of this actually comes to mind. A young woman who I graduated with and who was my academic advisor while I studied my intercultural and theology degrees at Fuller, Fuller Seminary, moved back to Minnesota this past year, which is where she's from. She moved back to the neighborhood that she grew up in, which just happens to be a few blocks from where George Floyd was murdered. When people began leaving flowers and other artifacts at the location of his death, she recognized the importance of these offerings and of having an actual place, a visual, where people could gather and be reminded of what had happened, not only for Floyd's memory, but also to express their own grief and hopes and to aid in the healing process. She took it upon herself to daily take care of and protect the site with a few other neighbors, cleaning up after protests, saving the things that people left, even gathering bits of artifacts that had survived after someone had started a fire nearby. She even went so far as to call those off artifacts that didn't survive burnt offerings. She saw that place as holy ground and is now one of the key people involved in discussions about some kind of permanent memorial and a future museum where many of the artifacts that have been left can be, can be kept. She understands that it's far too easy for people to forget and that people need a place and a way to come together and remember. And when we forget, we're unable to learn and be transformed. So we need these reminders, these memorials, to encourage us to confront our pain, our weaknesses, our mistakes, and our triumphs, so that we can continue to move forward and be transformed and changed, hopefully for the better. You know, this past year has been filled with people and events that seem impossible to forget, and many that I'm sure that we would like to forget. And yet, as history has shown, we are really good at changing the narrative in order to forget those things that we feel like are better off forgotten. But often, it's these very things that, if we allowed them to, could actually speak truth in a way that could shape us and transform us in ways that actually help us become more who God called us to be, created us to be. When processed in the context of a loving and supporting community, we're able to grieve, to heal, to grow, to be reminded of who we are called to be, and to encourage one another to press into the truth of our identity in Christ, even in the midst of challenging times like we're living in now. God wired us to need one another. And as we see in the Gospel of John, Jesus understood that when it was time for him to go away, his followers would need one another. In fact, one of his final prayers in John chapter 17, verses 20 and 23 was this. I am praying not only for these disciples, he says, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. That's us. I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one. As you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us so that the world will believe that you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me so they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Jesus is saying that in his absence, his followers are conti to continue to grow in unity in their understanding of God's love. As they come together and remind each other of the truth of who they are, they come to know who God is and who they are. He wanted them to remember and know who they were in Christ, how deeply loved they were, that they might share that with the rest of the world. And I think about the birth of the first church community of Christ followers. 
Jesus had risen from the dead and was continuing to show himself to his followers, but he was soon really ready to leave them for good. They may have grieved after that final time they spent with Jesus. I'm sure that they did. He, they felt like he was really gone. It would have been understandable if they all went their separate ways, confused and uncertain of what to do next. And yet they didn't. In the face of such uncertainty, they trusted in Jesus enough to do as he said and wait until the gift of the Holy Spirit was given to them. They couldn't have known what this would really be like or what it would even mean until it happened. But in Luke chapter 24, it says that after Jesus left them, they returned to Jerusalem filled with great joy, and they spent all their time in the temple praising God. They came together with joy and praised God, even though they could not have known what the future would bring. They were confident in their trust in God's promises, and they stayed together and encouraged one another, praising God together. And it was in this place that we read about in Acts chapter 2, where they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they were filled with love for one another in such a way that people were being added to their number every day. They were so filled with the Holy Spirit, so confident in who they were called to be, that they shared everything with each other, with those in need, and they prayed and worshiped together and continued to grow in what they were learning about who Christ was and who they were called to be. And we see this continued in communities that sprung up after this first one. In Ephesians 4, Paul writes to the church in Ephesus with great thanksgiving because of their strong faith in Jesus and their love for God's people everywhere, he says. And even so, he encourages them to continue to press into the truth of who they are in Christ. He encourages them and reminds them that they are God's masterpiece, that because of Christ and their faith in him, they can now come boldly and confidently into God's presence and that they have each been given unique gifts to serve one another and that they are to be children of light in a dark world. In chapter five, he encourages them to imitate God, therefore, in everything you do because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. You are God's child. And we, as a church, are meant to be the body of Christ, demonstrating who God is to each other and to the world. And when we forget who our creator is, we forget who we are, made in God's image, called to be imitators of Christ. We need to remember who we are, and we need the community of believers, community like this one, to help us to do that. Today, God wants to say, remember who you are. And I haven't been able to get a scene from a movie out of my head with those words that illustrates this idea. And as a mother of three small children, my movie references have become somewhat limited, but no less useful. So therefore, let me present to you an iconic scene from the Disney animated film, The Lion King. So for those of you who may not know the story, the premise is that the young cub Simba is being raised to be a future king of the Pride Lands once his father, Mufasa, is no longer alive. Of course, Mufasa's younger brother, Scar, has always been jealous and, and wanted to be king himself. So he devises a plan to get rid of Mufasa and Simba. He sends Simba into a deep gorge and gets the hyenas to start a stampede, which Simba puts Simba in grave danger. Mufasa runs into the gorge to save his son and almost escapes, but his brother Scar pushes him back into the gorge where he's trampled and killed. This is a sad part for a lot of kids to watch. Scar convinces the young Simba that it was his fault and tells him to run away and never come back, securing himself as the next line, and king, line in, to be king rather than Simba. The young and scared Simba does run away, and separated from his family and community that knew him so well, he's drawn into a seemingly worry-free life of the jungle as a means of trying to forget the life that he'd left behind. His identity as heir to the throne gradually becomes a distant memory. That is, until he runs into an old friend who thought he was dead and who knew him very well. She tries to convince him to take his rightful place as king from his uncle who has left the land devastated. 
And then we see this memorable scene that occurs where a baboon named Rafiki that was at Simba's dedication as a newborn tells Simba to look into a pool of water to see his father. At first, he only sees his reflection, but Rafiki tells him to look harder, and suddenly he sees the face of his father. The baboon then says, see, he lives in you. Simba then sees an image and hears the voice of his father in the sky saying, you have forgotten me. You have forgotten who you are, and therefore you have forgotten me. You are more than you have become. Remember who you are. It's at that moment that Simba must confront the identity that he's come to believe about himself, and he must make a choice. Does he continue to live his life doing what he wants, attempting to numb his pain with false ideas of a life of freedom, with no responsibilities to anyone other than himself? Or does he return to his community and embrace his identity, the true identity that he was created for, even if it means having to face his own brokenness, even if it means he must give everything for the good of the pride, for the health of the entire community? And he needs them just as much as they need him. There's a re reason that Rafiki tells Simba to look harder. He was unable to see the truth of who he was because he had been blinded by the lies that he believed about himself and the life that he was drawn into by those who didn't know who he really was. He had no one who knew his true identity to remind him of who he really was. In the absence of his community, to encourage him and remind him of his true identity, he slowly drifted from the truth. You see, we need the community to help us see. The community serves as a kind of memorial, a remembrance of who God is and therefore who we are. We need the community to remind us of God's truth, that you are loved, you matter, you have a necessary role in the body of Christ. I want to read an excerpt from a beautiful book that I came across recently called The Bees of Rainbow Falls by Preston Potu. It's a little lengthy, so you can follow along with me. He says, We strain to see God's world through our cataract-dimmed eyes. When we are restricted in our ability to see or sense God, we begin a rocky journey into ourselves, into a kind of closure. When we are blind to God, unable to see God's work in our lives or around us, we grow into a forgetful stasis, out of sight and out of mind, as they say. We forget our identity in Christ, and we forget God's redemptive work in the world around us. We forget the love of the Father. Forgetfulness is painful because it leads us towards two insidious and damaging responses, fear and disbelief. The two are closely connected because when we live in fear, feeling apart from God's embrace, we cannot trust God's goodness towards us. When the Father is not someone we feel we can trust, we assume a posture of disbelief and fearful doubt. In those moments where we cannot see God, when we imagine a false picture of the Father in our hearts, we react. We feel as though we are no longer sons and daughters, but orphans on the run. Adam and Eve had this move figured out. And so did Simba. They ran, covered themselves, and hid. Without a clear vision of God with us and a sense of the Spirit working around us, we retract and close up. The pain, guilt, and loneliness become too much for us. We cannot carry it, so we cover ourselves as best as we can. We busy ourselves with work and shallow pursuits, and we set our imaginations running after anything that will ease the pain. And those who simply do not have the energy, well, they give up. As apathy and fatalism set in, many people simply become numb to life and to their neighbor. They cannot see who they are, who God is, and those who live around them. The strangest part is that we can do this all with a contrived smile, thinking this is just how things go. All the while life piles up around us, it's an ensnaring vortex that starts when our eyes are closed. You know, left on our own, it becomes far easier to see God as more distant than near, more preoccupied than present, more withdrawn and withholding than generous. Our view of God becomes fuzzy, 
And as Mufasa tells Simba, when we forget who we are, whose we are, we also forget who God is. And when we forget who God really is, a God of grace, mercy, forgiveness, love, kindness, we forget who we are, forgiven, loved, cherished, chosen. And when we forget who we are, we're unable to see who we can become, who we are called to be, those who are full of grace and mercy, forgiveness, love, and kindness for one another. And when we're unable to see who we can become, we rely on the world to shape us into what it would have us believe that we should be, fine on our own, looking out for ourselves and our own needs. We need the encouragement of community, our community, to remember who we are and to be shaped and transformed into the people God created us to be. James Bryant Smith says in his book, I want a community who will challenge me to become who I already am, one in which Christ dwells and delights, a light to the world, salt to the earth, the aroma of Christ to a dying world. I want a community who will remind me of who I am and who will watch over me with love. I believe this community functions that way. I think we have that here. And friends, it may feel like life has stopped in many of the ways that we're used to. And I know the temptation can be to put our relationship with God and one another on hold also. But just because life as we know it has stopped in many ways and has stopped working, God has not. Jesus has not stopped being with us, not stopped guiding us. He has not stopped speaking to us. We need to remind one another that we are not alone and that God is still working in and through us. If anything, it's in times like these that we need to be the hands and feet of Jesus to one another and to our communities and to the world. The author of Hebrews knew the importance of this encouragement as well. The writer was actually writing to a group of Christians who had suffered in the past and were now threatened with even more suffering. And the writer was concerned that even though they had remained faithful before, that they might now turn away from Christ to avoid further persecution and pain. And this is the encouragement that we can take to heart in these times that we're living in as well. The writer says, Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works, and let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. You know, we may not be able to meet together in the ways that we are used to, but that doesn't mean that we can't be creative and think of ways to motivate, encourage, and remind one another of who we are, whose we are, and who we're called to be to one another in the world. So at this time, I'd like to invite the worship team to come back up. And as they do, I want to share just a list of a few ideas I put together of what being an encouraging community might look like during these times. And I think it can look like many things other than meeting together in this physical space, though I certainly think that's the preferred way, and I can't wait until we're all able to be together again. But it means we can use our creativity to find whatever ways we can to stay connected to each other. I know you may not be feeling this way, but really thank God for technology and the opportunity we have to still see and speak to one another even when we can't be together in person. And this church has many opportunities for us to still be connected in that way. We have life groups that are going to be starting again in January, most of which will be over Zoom. And we have opportunities to receive prayer also. On your connection card, there's a place to request someone to email you about a time that you can respond back so someone can actually pray with you over Zoom or over the phone. We need to take advantage of these opportunities. And we've had opportunities even to serve the community together, even while being masked and social distanced. How many of you participated in the Thanksgiving giveaway that happened a couple weeks ago? Yeah, I think the fact that so many of you came out to serve says something about how God has wired us. We feel more who we are created to be when we're demonstrating the love of Christ through our lives. Like when we take time out, our time and our gifts and our service to help those in need. 
So here are just a few practical ideas I wanted to share with you of what that might look like. And I'm sure you could think of many others to be added to this list. A few might be call, text, email, send a letter, what are those even? To a friend with a word of encouragement. Get involved with a life group. Call or send a card, a package, photos, something to someone who's in a care facility that can't get out right now. Donate food and clothing to shelters that are struggling right now. Do small kinds of acts, uh, small acts of kindness for strangers or for friends, paying for a coffee, saying a kind word to someone who looks like they're struggling. I've been trying to be intentional lately about saying what I think in the moment instead of waiting until later, whether it be a prayer or a word of encouragement over text or the phone, to say it as you think of it so that we don't forget. Also, read the Bible. Talk about it with someone. Memorize some verses of encouragement for yourself and so that you can give them to others when they need them. Offer to pray for a friend over the phone. Ask someone to pray for you over the phone. If it's safe to do so, offer to share child care duties with another family so that parents can get a break and have some time to be alone together. These are all just simple things that we can do to remain connected to one another. And I think this community will be stronger for it. And I know that many of us have hearts that desire to serve and that we can remind one another who we are. And so today's soul training exercise is along these lines as well. Be an encourager is the first one. Reach out to someone who you think needs a reminder of who they are in Christ and in this community. Look around you today. Who is not here today? Maybe you could reach out to someone. And if you're at home right now, think of others that could be encouraged by hearing the message here today and other Sundays, the devotionals that are happening in the week. Remind each other that even if we can't be together in person, that we are still a community and that we are still here to remind each other of who we are. And then secondly, choose a practical way to demonstrate the love of Christ to someone through the unique gifts that God has given you. I know each of us have unique things to give. And so I want to encourage you to find ways to do that for someone else. So I just want to pray for us right now that God would help us to do that, um, that he would help us to know how we can encourage one another and that we would be reminded of who we are today. God, I thank you that you are with us. I thank you that you see us right where we are, our flaws and all, our fears, our uncertainties. And God, you desire for us to remind, be reminded that you are a good God and that you are with us and that we can be confident in who you have created us to be, that we are loved, that we are cherished, that we are cared for, that you see us and know us. So God, today, would you encourage our hearts? Would you help us to know that we are not alone and that we are your children? Amen. So the worship team is going to continue to play for a bit and they will dismiss you. And I would love to say hello to you in the back on your way out. But uh, go with peace today and be encouraged in God's love for you. Thank you. Let's stand together if you're able, friends. We're going to sing this song over you. This is Sons and Daughters opportunity for us to respond to what the Lord has shared with us through Courtney today. This is who we are, sons and daughters. We're crying out for your living water we need the love of the perfect father this is who we are 
sons and daughters. We come as your children, say yes to you, Father. We've come to drink deep of your living water. We've come as your children, say yes to you, Father. We're born of the Spirit, the blood and the water. We're going to make a space just to welcome the Spirit to... Uh, do the work that only God can do in our lives right now. So uh, if you're feeling like you just like to say, God, remind me who I am so that I can be who you've called me to be, I just welcome to, you to just kind of put your hands out in front of you. And I believe that the, the Lord just sees that and blesses that and says, I will. I will rest upon you. I will fill you. So, Lord, as we put out our hands, we ask that you would fill us, that you'd empower us, that you'd strengthen us, that you'd remind us of your presence and your goodness so that we can remind others of your presence and your goodness. We come as your children. We come as your children. Say yes to you, Father. We've come to drink deep of your living water. Let it go. We come as your children, say yes to you, Father. We say yes, we say yes. We're born of the Spirit, the blood and the water. Oh, we come. We come as your children, say yes to you, Father. We've come to drink deep of your living water. We've come as your children, say as to you, Father. We're born of the Spirit, the blood and the water. Receiving love, we're your sons and daughters. A perfect love. From a perfect father, receiving love, sons and daughters, a perfect love, you're a perfect father. We're going to continue to worship together and you're welcome to stay, especially if the presence of the Lord is upon you. There's no rush. And if you have to head out, just want to bless you in Jesus' name. So good to be church family with you. Look forward to next week. Make sure you say hi to uh, Courtney on your way out. Thank you for her service to us today. Love you, friends. And love has come to meet us, love. Calls no distance far. And love arrives among us. Love takes us as we are. Maker of all creation, you made yourself so You guide us with one star. One star, one hope, one promise you will lead us so back home. One cry deep in my heart.
One star, one. 